You and your colleagues had a hypothesis. Can you explain a little bit what, what it was that you were looking at? We were looking at whether mindfulness and yoga can help young people kind of help promote their positive mental health, help promote better capacity of handling stress. So we were really interested in looking at that. And we also just wanted to see our mindfulness and yoga programs able to be delivered in schools? Will teachers and principals and students like them and accept them? Did you have an interest in that area? Is that where you started? It wasn't actually my focus of study initially. Um, I had learned about mindfulness when I was a graduate student and I had taken a course in something called mindfulness-based stress reduction. And it was to help me be trained as a therapist, but I loved it because it was really helpful to reduce stress. And I was a stressed out graduate student, so that was really useful. Um, it wasn't part of my research, though, and it was... Um, I was sitting in my office one day and one of my colleagues came by and asked me if I wanted to come to a meeting, and I happened to be there, and I went and the guys from the Holistic Life Foundation were there, along with uh, um, Mark Greenberg, who was at Penn State University, was a big expert in social emotional development, and he was really excited about the potential of mindfulness interventions. I had never met Mark before, or the yogis, and we had a meeting, and at the end, we had a collaboration, and um, we did the study that I'm gonna be talking about today, and since that time, I've been doing research on mindfulness programs in education, and I really love this work. So it, it kind of changed my <laughs> it changed my work. Yeah. What are we talking about when we're talking about mindfulness training, mm -hmm. and how is that different from from yoga? Mindfulness really is about paying attention in a very intentional way, being in the present moment, trying to have an open and non judgmental awareness of what's happening around you, within you. And the programs that the Holistic Life Foundation offer include training in breathing techniques to help young people focus. They also use active yoga-based poses, especially when they work with younger children. Tell me a little bit about the study. How large was your sample size? How did you go about uh, conducting your research? Yeah, we recruited four different Baltimore City public schools. Within those schools, we recruited about 25 fourth and fifth graders in each of the schools. So we had a sample of 97 students, and we assigned two of those schools to receive the mindful yoga program, and the other two schools were our control schools, so they did not receive programming. We assigned the schools randomly, like flipping a coin, and then we had all the students who were part of the study fill out a survey. The survey asked about how they coped with stress, their mood, whether they experienced a lot of negative emotions or symptoms of depression and relationships with friends. We delivered the program, the Holistic Life Foundation delivered the program over 12 weeks and it was delivered during the school day, but the students didn't miss any core academic classes. It was about 45 minute sessions, four days a week. And at the end of the 12 weeks, we had the students fill out another survey that asked about the same kinds of things. And what did you find after those 12 weeks? What we found was that students who were in the mindful yoga group had significantly better capacity to respond to stress. So their scores on that survey showed us that they were able to respond to stress with less emotional arousal and less rumination and thoughts that would keep popping up for them that would be worrying. Um, and so it seemed like the program was helpful in um, building emotion regulation skills for the young people. We also saw some patterns in the scores um, that were not significant statistically, but were heading in the right direction in the sense that kids in the program um, looked like their um, negative emotions and symptoms of depression were less than those in the other group. Although, as I said, not statistically significant. Evidence the pattern of the scores that. were in the direction that we predicted that they would be in. Um, we had a small sample, but it suggested to us that the program may have promise in terms of 
um, helping children to regulate stress and, and that downstream that may have more impact on depression and negative emotion. Why is that self-control or self-regulation so important, especially at this age range? What we find is that kids who are exposed to chronic stress and trauma have impacts on their brains in development and impacts on their ability to respond to stressful situations. So what happens when we're in a dangerous situation is that we go into fight or flight mode, we get that switch is turned on and we're ready to run away or to fight. And if we're in chronically stressful situations, that switch is flipped on and we may have less capacity to settle, to observe what our emotions are, and to make thoughtful decisions about how to respond in situations. So we're more likely to respond impulsively, um, and it's harder to settle, it's harder to sit in class and learn and remember, it's harder to um, have relationships with friends or with other adults, with adults. Um, so what mindfulness can do is to teach us ways of quieting the mind and being able to just observe what's happening. And even when what we observe is painful emotions or things around us that may be uncomfortable, we can learn how to sit with that and take a pause before deciding how to act. Why is this especially important in the, in the school sample that you and your researchers study? Right, a lot of young people in Baltimore are growing up in situations where they are coping with stressors that are associated with poverty. They are dealing with um, communities with high rates of violence, gang activity, drug activity, and they may also be experiencing stress in the home. So a lot of these young people are coming into school in a state of fight or flight and they may not have those tools in terms of learning how to regulate their emotions so that they can make the best possible choices for themselves. What do these findings suggest? We were really encouraged that first, the study suggests that it's possible to do mindful yoga in schools, that we were able to integrate programming into the school day, the teachers, the principals, and the students seem to enjoy the programming and to appreciate it. So that's actually really important because we didn't know if that was true when we started. And there, at the time, were almost no randomized studies with urban youth around mindfulness or yoga. So this is encouraging in terms of whether we can continue using this as a strategy in education settings. We also saw some early promise for this kind of program, and I need to highlight that we need more research on this. We're not at a place where we know the answers yet in terms of which uh, mindfulness programs may be right for which children, um, what are the effects on young people of different ages, how much of a yoga program needs to be delivered or a mindfulness program. Um, but it did show early promise that these kinds of programs are worth researching. Is it difficult to get the buyback from, from lawmakers or from even from some school districts? Is this one of those things where it's tough to get people to buy into the program? We have had a lot of enthusiasm and support. Principals have generally been really open to having mindfulness-based programs in their schools. I think there are challenges that come when principals are stretched very thin and schools are under-resourced in terms of having infrastructure to support doing the programs well. And then the biggest challenge is that even if we see that a program is working really well, to go from there to having it be a sustainable part of a school or a district is really challenging. So you need sort of continued funds for that and ways of supporting infrastructure to keep it going. In terms of the, the program that we saw at Lincoln Elementary, which mm -hmm. is overseen by the Holistic Life yeah. Foundation, um, can you just tell me a little bit about how they are able to do what they do in the schools? The Holistic Life Foundation is really special, I think, because the founders grew up in Baltimore. They really get the culture of the students here. They understand the challenges that kids are facing, and they also understand 
what TV shows and music people are into. They can, they can relate with the young people. I think they help make yoga really real. Um, and I think they serve as helpful mentors and role models as they teach. Um, they are also very experienced at working in school settings. So they know how to work with principals, how to work with teachers um, in a way that supports the school climate and isn't disruptive. And in fact, since I first met them, they've done more and more work now with whole school settings so that they're not just working with a particular grade or class, but as you saw, they are um, trying to create more supportive and safe environments in schools as a whole. And I think that's really innovative. Was that there that difficulty with parents in, again, in the, the buy-in to a program? I think it's something that we really need to be careful about in this field because there have been lawsuits in different parts of the country when parents were concerned that their children were being taught some sort of religious or spiritual practice that they hadn't consented to. So it's important to be very clear that you are doing a secular program, um, to be clear with parents what the program is about. In our work, parents have always had a choice about whether or not their children participated. Um, and so it's, I think, a real issue that people need to be clear about. Is there anything in looking at these programs that are working in the schools that you would want parents to know about? One thing I hadn't mentioned is that we also did focus groups with students who were in the program and with teachers. And I've also talked with students that Holistic Life has worked with in other schools. And students talk a lot about using the breath. So when they're not in the class, the most common thing that they'll say that they used when they were in a situation where they felt stressed is the breath. And they'll talk about how they made a different choice because they took that time to slow it down and breathe. And they decided maybe they didn't have to get into this particular fight or they were able to walk away from a situation. And I think it's good for parents to know that because the breath is something we all carry with us everywhere and we can access it whenever we want to put our attention there. What's the next step? One thing that's really exciting is that in the past 10 years, there's been a lot of research emerging on mindfulness in school contexts. And there's a lot of promising findings coming out of that work. Again, we're in, as a field, we're in really early stages, but I think that we are starting to see more evidence that mindfulness practices can benefit young people. Um, so as a field, we need to continue to push our studies to do rigorous study designs with larger samples, with longer follow-up times to see how young people are responding over time. And I think to get a better idea of which students are most helped by these programs and how are they working. So a project that we're just beginning in collaboration with Holistic Life um, and also in collaboration with Penn State University and uh, Dr. Diana Fishbein is a co-lead on this project with me. We're going to be looking at whether a mindfulness program for ninth grade students affects um, the body's stress physiology. So actually looking at heart rate variability to see what do these practices do to potentially alter how the body pro reacts. If you could uh, just refresh my memory, what, what you found in terms of um, mm -hmm. comparison. We found that students in the yoga program had improvements in their ability to respond to stress compared to the control group. And that was from a self-reported survey. And, and then they also told us about how they were using those skills in the focus groups. Is there anything I didn't ask you? One thing that maybe I should have said, you did ask me sort of what is mindfulness, but um, maybe I should say that, um, you know, not all mindfulness programs use yoga. Yoga is one technique that can be thought of as a mindfulness practice. Um, I often like to think of it as mindful movement. So our attention and focus is on body movement and breath, um, whereas other mindfulness practices may focus more specifically 
on uh, a guided meditation, a breathing practice. Um, yoga may also have other types of benefits through physical movement. So it's, you know, potentially um, has its own um, additional pathways. If we could start just a little bit about your background where you got your undergraduate degree, master's degree, and advanced degree. I have an undergrad degree from Yale and that's in humanities and then <laughs> and then I was in book publishing and then I went <laughs> um, then I got a PhD in clinical psychology from Duke 